Graham. Uh, so I am Randy Schaup. I'm the VP of Engineering at Stitch Fix. Uh, I want to talk about managing data at scale, the unreasonable effectiveness of events. So first, a little bit about Stitch Fix to set some context. So Stitch Fix is an online clothing retailer, and rather than going to a store, whether physical or virtual, and choosing your own clothes, what if you had an expert to do it for you? So you fill out a pretty detailed style profile of you know, styles you like, your sizes, height, weight, whether you're a parent, all sorts of stuff. You will receive five hand-picked items for you, so hand-chosen for you by one of our 3,500 human stylists around the country. You will keep the things that you like and pay for those, and you will return the rest for free. So how does that go uh, in the back? So uh, we use a ton of data and data science to make this actually happen. So we have a bunch of inventory in our warehouses. We do a ton of machine learned models, predicting size, predicting style preference, um, predicting price preference, and we sort of ensemble all those models up together into a recommendation score. So we actually compute a set of personalized recommendations for every client. So essentially every day we're scoring every piece of inventory times every client and producing a predicted probability of purchase, which means what's the probability that if we send this shirt to Randy, he will keep it. So you know, 65% probability I'll keep this shirt, 47% chance for these pants, and you know, 52% for the shoes, something like that. Those personalized recommendations are shown to our expert human curators, we call them stylists, um, and they figure out the five things that go together, you know, put an outfit together or um, match a request that you have for, you know, get me something great for a Manhattan evening wedding or something like that, and we send you a box in the mail and it arrives on your doorstep. So data is at the center of, uh, of our approach. And in fact, we are, a, we are pretty unique in our industry. Um, we actually have equal numbers of sort of software engineers and data scientists. So we have over 100 engineers on the, in the group that I work in. We also have 80 data scientists and algorithm developers that are developing algorithms for all sorts of things. So every aspect of our business is run essentially by data science. So what things we're gonna buy, where and how we're gonna store them in the warehouses, how they're gonna get to you uh, at, on time, all, obviously the recommendations, the personalized recommendations for the stylists, and then more standard things like predicting customer demand. And our approach, or our secret sauce, which is not so secret, is humans and machines working together. So what can we do to have the humans do what the humans do best, and what can we do to have the machines do what the machines do best? So. When we started, we, we've been around for six years, so as a small startup, we of course built a small number of uh, applications and we had a monolithic database. So over time, of course, uh, that was exactly, by the way, the right thing to do when we were small and still figuring out our business model, still figuring out how to delight our early customers, but now that we have a pretty large scale, um, we now have another set of design goals that come with scale, right? So we, we need to think about feature velocity, how quickly can our teams uh, add new features? We need to think about scalability, how can we continue to grow the systems uh, you know, over time? And then we need to think about resilience, right? We need to think about how do we handle and sort of bound component failures that happen in a distributed system. System. So, uh, the, as you can imagine from the, from the topic, um, we are moving toward a microservices architecture. And we are not alone in that. So I used to work at eBay. Um, eBay, depending on how you count, is now on its fifth generation of its infrastructure, so a fifth complete rewrite. So it started famously as a, a weekend project by the founder in 1995. He was, that was a monolithic Perl application. It then evolved in the version two to a monolithic C++ application, which at its worst was 3.4 million lines of code in a single DLL. Yeah, you think you have a monolith, ha. Um, we were actually hitting compiler limits on the number of methods per class, 16K. Yeah, that was no fun to work in. Uh, the V3 was Java, um, so we rebuilt the, we sort of divided the monolithic application into mini applications, you know, for search, for selling, for buying, et cetera, and now it's fair to characterize eBay as a polyglot set of microservices. So Twitter has gone through a similar evolution. So they started famously as a monolithic Rails application, which they affectionately named the monorail, very clever. Um, the next iteration was sort of pulling a bunch of the front end out into JavaScript, a bunch of back end into services, mostly written in Scala, and then now it's fair to characterize Twitter as a polyglot set of microservices. 
Amazon has gone through a similar evolution. So it's not so clean on the architectural generations, but it started as a monolithic Perl C++ application, which, by the way, you can still see in a bunch of product detail pages. So if you ever see in the URL Obidos, O-B-I-D-O-S, that was the name of the original monolithic application at Amazon. Um, they uh, spent five years building a service-oriented architecture from 2000 to 2005, lots of back-end services in Java and Scala and other languages, and now it's fair to characterize Amazon as a polyglot set of microservices. So what can we learn from this evolution, right? I think we can learn two things. That no successful company has started with microservices. It is absolutely right when you are still trying to figure out your business model to do things as a monolith. But past a certain scale, which not everybody is going to reach, let's be honest, everybody ends up on something that we now call microservices. Does this make sense? Cool. So the other way I like to think about it is if you don't end up regretting your early technology decisions, you probably over-engineered. Cool. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about microservices, and then I'm going to add events as a sort of tool in our architectural toolbox, and we'll see how we can do uh, some cool things with that. So microservices, I guess we still have to keep defining them. Uh, the micro in microservices means that they are single purpose, they have a simple, well-defined interface, and they are modular and independent. And one of the things we learned over time now versus the first time we attempted uh, service-oriented architecture in the 90s is that in order for services to be successful, they need to have isolated persistence. So this is exactly what Neha was just talking about, where each individual service has its own data storage, right? So its own database, its own search engine, or whatever, its own persistence mechanism. And that is different from a monolith, right? When you have a monolithic database, everything is all there, but in microservices, all our data is distributed all over the place. So, with, but we still want all those great things that we got out of our monolith, right? We still want to, we want, still want to have a way to do shared data. We still want to figure out a way to do joins, and we still would like to have transactions. Does it make sense? Does these things see, seem like we'd want to have them? Yeah. Uh, cool. Well, so enter events. So if we have events as a first-class construct in our architecture, we're going to be able to solve a bunch of these problems. So uh, Wikipedia defines an event as a significant change in state. I like to call it a statement that something interesting occurred. Uh, we are all very familiar um, with a th the traditional three-tier system. Some of us you know, cut our teeth on building those systems for many years. So the traditional system is something like there is a presentation layer, there is an application or business logic layer, and there is a persistence layer, traditionally a relational database. I claim that we are missing something fundamental if we leave with only those three. We are missing the fourth fundamental building block, which is some representation of state changes or some representation of events. And of course, events are asynchronous in most, uh, most situations, so we might have nobody listening to events that we produce, we might have one cus a consumer of our events, or we might have many consumers listening to that event. So a great tool to have in your toolbox if you want to do events would be some hypothetical publish subscribe uh, event platform. We might name it Apache Kafka, um, but that's a great tool to have in your toolbox in order when you're going to do uh, an event-driven system. So I want to talk about microservices uh, and events a little bit. So when we think of a service interface, classically, we don't really think about uh, events. So I claim that we need to think of events as a first-class part of the interface that we make for our services. So I assert that a service interface is the obvious thing, right? It is the synchronous request response kind of front door, right? So that could be REST and JSON. That could be gRPC. Man, that could even be CORBA. There are a couple people that will remember that. Um, it, but it also should be the events of the, that the service produces, it should be the events that the service consumes, and it should also be any kind of, you know, bulk reads or writes, so bulk uh, uh, loads or, you know, bulk reads in sort of an ETL to, a, uh, to an analytical system. Any way, any mechanism that gets data into or out of your service is part of the interface. Does this make sense? Yeah. Cool. Because uh, we didn't always think this way, and now, you know, we've made our mistakes, and now we're kind of seeing, wow, you know, everything that I do should be inside a, you know, published, well-maintained, simple uh, service boundary. Okay, so let's start talking about some of those, uh, some of those techniques. So, again, one of, the, one of the first things I want to have, uh, I still want to have after I got rid of my monolith, is shared data. So in a monolithic database, shared data is super easy. It's just you know, this little green table, and I can you know, use it whenever I need to. But where does shared data go in a microservices world? 
So I'll give, you, uh, I'll give you a couple of options, but first I want to give you a little bit of a principle. So the principle here is that any interesting piece of data in your system ought to be owned by a one and only one service. Now there might be replicas of it, of course, because uh, it's you know, distributed, but every piece of data is owned by a canonical system of record for that data. Is this making sense? Right, so in this example, there is a customer service which owns canonically the customer information. And any other, there are lots of other places in the system where we might use, you know, the customer address or, you know, the customer name or something like that. Any other place in our system where we use customer information is not the system of record. It is a read-only, non-authoritative cache. I'll let that sink in. Does that make sense? There is one place that owns the rights, essentially, that owns, that owns the object and, hold, and uh, has it up to date, and every other place is a sort of stale read-only copy, which we keep around for you know, replication or for speed or something like that. Does this make sense? Okay, cool. All right, that's all with the like, architectural building blocks. Now I will start to do applications. So the first approach to shared data is simply look it up. Right? So at Stitch Fix, we have a service that's going to fulfill our packages so that that's actually how it gets from our warehouse to your doorstep, and we need to know your address. So we could absolutely look it up in real time, and that would be good. And this is a completely legitimate technique that we use all the time at Stitch Fix, and I'm sure you do too. Another approach is maybe that doesn't work for uh, performance reasons or scalability reasons or reliability reasons. So instead, what we, we still have the customer uh, service own the data. It's still the system of record. But anytime there are changes to the customer data, it produces an event. Those events are consumed by the fulfillment service. And the fulfillment service locally caches, for example, the customer address. Is this making sense? Cool. All right. So that is shared data. The next thing we want to have in our toolbox, or uh, next uh, thing we'd like to have architecturally, is to be able to do joins. So again, in a monolithic database, joins are super easy. So I just add another table to the from clause, and I'm good. So select from A, now I interjoin it to B, I'm very happy. But again, once we have split the data across microservices, joins are, uh, joins are really hard. So there are a couple of techniques here. So the first is just simply join it in real time when you need it, right? So let's imagine in this example that we want to show our customers an order history page. So we want to show them all the orders they've given, uh, they've uh, gotten from Stitch Fix. Um, so we might go first to the customer service to get some information about the customer. Then we might secondarily go to and read a bunch of orders that the customer has done with us historically. Does this make sense? Right? This is basically every web page you've ever written, right? I mean, unless it all comes from a single data source, this is a mashup of two different data sources. So very common technique, uh, nothing wrong with it. Again, sometimes that is not uh, uh, pr appropriately performant, it's not sufficiently scalable, it's not sufficiently reliable. So another approach here is have a service that, as Neha said, materializes the view, right? So in this example, we want to produce an item feedback service. So we send out the items in our inventory to millions of different clients, and each of them gives us some feedback about whether it fit well, whether it matched their style, whether it was priced appropriately. And so uh, we could query those things all the time, uh, which would be quite inefficient. Or we could simply you know, listen to updates from the item service, for example, listen to updates from the order feedback service, listen to those events, and materiali materialize that view in an item feedback service uh, represented here. Does this make sense? If this seems at all weird, it's actually a super familiar technique. So obviously in commercial grade database systems, materialized view is a thing you can have. Most actually NoSQL systems do this. So if you use Cassandra or React, you're actually already doing this up front, right? So you're up front writing all the queries you're gonna do in parallel and then reading them uh, really fast. Every search engine in the world is essentially a join between different data sources, uh, or every interesting search engine. So uh, that's absolutely another, another use of this. And of course, every analytical system that we have is some flavor of joining between different entities. Is this making sense? Is this feeling more familiar, maybe? All right, cool. So you use this all the time, even though maybe you didn't realize it. OK. So the last uh, technique I want to share with you is how to deal with transactions. So uh, the answer is, is thinking about a transaction not as some you know, acid, atomic uh, unit of work, but uh, thinking about it more as a workflow or something that we'll call a saga. 
So in the monolithic database, transactions across multiple entities are very easy. That's one of the things that's really wonderful about a relational database. So we can issue a statement or a set of statements that looks like this, right? We begin a transaction, we insert some records into A, we update some records in B, we commit. And that is done, you know, since it's, if it's a relational database, that is done in an acid way. So it's all done or not at all. Um, and that makes life very easy and very, a very simple programming model. But uh, once we've split our data across services, so if the A stuff lives in one service and the B stuff lives in another service, this is very, uh, very challenging. And as you are about to be reminded by Pat in a moment, um, the way not to do this is with a distributed transaction, right? That is the, as Pat will remind you, the anti-availability protocol. So that, if you definitely don't want to scale and don't want to be reliable, for sure use distributed transactions. Um, so don't. Um, but yeah, so once we have split data across services, how can we get this transactional behavior? Well, the answer is we're not going to be able to do it atomically, but we are going to be able to do it eventually. So here's the idea, is that rather than thinking of the transaction as a thing that I do all at once or not at all, what if we turn it into a, a saga? Or another way I like to think about it is, what if I can model that transaction as a state machine of individual atomic events? Right? So let's imagine that we implement it more as a workflow. So we update, the, update or insert into the A thing, that produces some event. That uh, causes the B thing to you know, update itself or insert more records, which then uh, produces one or more other events, which are then consumed by C and updating more things. Is this conceptually making sense? So the A thing happens, then the B thing happens, then the C thing happens. You might ask, well, you know, in databases I can just do a rollback. How do you do in that in this situation? Well, so the answer is just simply apply the compensating operations in reverse. Or if you want to think about it from the state machine perspective, move backward along the transitions in the state machine uh, toward, uh, toward the beginning. So let's imagine that we needed to roll it back from the end. So we you know, undo the operations in C. That produces one or several events. That undoes the operations in B, or the, you know, the changes that we made in B. And then uh, that produces one or more events. And then we undo the operations in A. Is this making sense? Does it feel a little bit unfamiliar, though? It's OK to nod. Yeah, a few people? All right, it shouldn't be. So every, tons of common systems that you're going to use actually today um, do exactly this. So every time you use your credit card, uh, you, are, you are starting off one of these workflows. So what does not happen when you use a credit card is that your bank and the merchant's bank do a distributed transaction. That does not happen. What does happen, though, is a series of events. It's actually super complicated uh, between your bank and a bunch of intermediaries and then the merchant's bank on the other side. And so ultimately, you know, the money flows from your pocket virtually into the merchant's pocket. Um, so payment processing is a great example. Really, other, lots of other aspects of financial services are the same way. So for example, when you're doing currency trading, so you know, when Deutsche Bank and Bank of America are trading currencies, like, they are not doing distributed transactions. They are firing messages at each other and then reconciling at the end of the day. So expense approvals are another example. So if anybody is from out of town and has traveled here, you know, maybe you went to a jazz club last night and maybe you're hoping to you know, like, um, get that be a business expense and get that you know, uh, approved. Uh, so you, uh, you, you, know, you submit that expense approval to your boss. She sit, submits it to her boss. She submits it to her boss and so on. If you're lucky, it gets approved, but probably not in this example. But really, any multi-step workflow is an example of this technique, right? It is a chain or a state machine of individual atomic events um, that together give you the ultimate uh, result. Is this making sense? Cool. So. Again, we're in this microservices world where we have taken our nice, safe, everything in one place monolithic database and divided up that data over a bunch of different services. And we have done this to get scale, we have done this to get feature velocity, we have done this to get reliability. But again, we still want to have shared data, we still want to have joins, we still want to have at least something like transactions where something happens ultimately or doesn't happen ultimately. And the answer is events. Thank you very much. <laughs>